Shalom, my friends, and welcome to another Jewish Forum program. I'm your host, Barry Herman, and I have a very special guest tonight, and his topic is unbelievable. I mean that sincerely. Okay, my guest is David Bash, and David is a licensed architect planner and a celebrated author of several books about William Shakespeare and his Jewish influences. Let me repeat that. Shakespeare and his Jewish influences. David, welcome. Glad to be here. Well, we're glad to have you here. Okay, why don't you tell our viewing audience, we only have 30 minutes, in a couple minutes, a little bit about your background, um, your life, achievements, anything you want our viewers to know. You're on. Well, I worked for the, I trained as an architect and also uh, got a degree in city planning. And I worked for many years, a good deal of my uh, uh, professional life on the staff of the University of Connecticut. And uh, my alma mater, by the way. Well, okay. And well, I had an opportunity to work on the remodeling of the campus and uh, planning for its uh, development. And um, um, and as I was doing that, I was next to a library which had all those books, and I was able to, uh, in my spare time, visit the library and. Uh, uh, tap into the collection of, uh, of books on Shakespeare. Okay, speaking of Shakespeare, um, we talked briefly before the program, and you had mentioned that some people believe that Shakespeare was Jewish, besides his Jewish influences. Are you alone in that view? Well, no, now there was a time where there was one other person, a person, named Neil Hurston, who came from uh, South Africa. And he uh, had a theory that Shakespeare was a Jew because when he read The Merchant of Venice and saw the play, he studied the, the text and he said, Shakespeare uh, presented Antonio, the merchant, as someone who had formerly been a Jew. And that uh, now he became a Christian, and that's when Shylock had engaged him. Oh, okay. Um, you also talked about Talmudic quotations and references. Do you have a few that you'd like to share? Certainly. For example, um, by the way, Shakespeare's work is dotted with these uh, quotations from the Talmud. For example, Richard III says, sin will pluck on sin, which for those who have some Hebrew background know that's Avera, Goreras Avera from Pirkei Ovot. You mean that's right from the Bible? And not from the Bible, from the Talmud. You oh, see, the Talmud, okay. Everybody knew the, the, the Bible the, at that the time. Oral, the oral, the yeah, oral. Right, but yeah, few right. knew no one who knew the Talmud, the and Talmud. why would Shakespeare know the Talmud? And, and this is the situation with Shakespeare. He has this knowledge of Judaica, and you ask, where, where did he get it from? Uh, and, what other examples can well, you give? Well, I'll give you another example. Um, you have from your book. Well, I, I have them in my books. I do mention, but we won't have much time, but I'll give you yeah. an example. Um, uh, here's a, here is from here is the quotation from the Talmud. Rabbi Hanina, the vice high priest, said, "Pray for the welfare of the government, since but for the fear thereof, men would swallow each other alive." Now that was in the Talmud Pirkei Avot. That's the ethics of the fathers. Now here is the way it appears in Coriolanus. In in that's the play by Shakespeare. And the, the character Marcius says, what's the matter that in this, these several places of the city you cry, against a noble cell, you cry against a noble senate who under the gods keep you in awe, which else would feed on one another? 
In both cases, you feed on one another. In both cases, God keeps you in awe. So it's a direct parallel. So he, <laughs> here is a, a character in Shakespeare speaking directly uh, Interesting. from uh, Merchant of Venice. All right. You also mentioned um, in our talking about some of Shakespeare's sonnets uh, that th there's some Jewish influences. Oh, yes, indeed. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, by the way, these are the only works by Shakespeare which you know it came from his hand because he wrote these sonnets and, he, and, and his name appears on every page of the sonnets. And what's interesting about the uh, the sonnets, he ha they are they have he put embedments in them. For example, he writes his name in some of the the sonnets. For example, if you uh, look carefully, you'll see that if you look vertically or and diagonally uh, and trace the letters, you'll see that he actually traces out his name. And uh, I showed um, Barry uh, an example where he has will, but without the I, W-L-L -L vertically, and then abreast of it, shake spear, uh, a diagonal which says shake, and another diagonal which says spear. So there's his name. But one of many, many kinds of uh, uh, embedments which he put in. Well, how does that apply Jewishness? Well, uh, in that case, no. However, when uh, now you you are familiar with the Kaddish, when, when yes. uh, you it's a praise of God, and mourners say a the Kaddish for, right, for the departed. lead the prayer, and the answer when the uh, uh, mourner begins it, uh, Yisgadal, the Yisgadash, Shmei Rabba. The answer from the from the congregation is Yehei Shmei Rabbah Mavarachli Olam Umei Omaya. He embeds all eight of those Aramaic words in a number of his sonnets. For example, uh, I, I guess it, we can't show it here, but I showed it to you, where in diagonals and so on. Well, if you want to hold it up. Uh, well, I could try to do that and see if. Yeah. Well, here is an example. It's a sonnet 40. Um, I don't know if it can be seen. I, I'm not and sure. Probably right. would not carry. Well, but the maybe point turn is. Turn it a certain way, maybe at an angle. No, I guess it's not showing up. Right. It, it probably it's too light for it. But, yeah. but uh, I showed this to Barry. Yeah. And the fact is that here's a, he wrote a, a sonnet. That means he had to think of the idea of the sonnet. And then he had to plan out the words and so forth so that they would give you configurations of words. The letters would, would spell and, and, right. and would uh, uh, transliterate because they were in, the, the, in for example, the Kaddish is in Aramaic. So he has the Aramaic words in the, in the, in the sonnet. Really? And, yes. In, in 14 lines, can you imagine he puts these eight words in it, which shows that he had to arrange the, the theme of the sonnet. He had to think about what words and the letters and how they would come out and so on. And it tells you that he must have um, uh, been involved in the, in the uh, uh, arrangement of the sonnets and so on, so that he was deeply involved in that. Uh, there's much more to that. For example, another element of it, which I have one of my books, The Shakespeare Codes, where I discovered that in, in, in the sonnets, numbers are letters. Uh, that a sonnet number, let's take sonnet 18. Uh, that's in Hebrew, in Hebrew, uh, numbers are letters. For example, th uh, the number 18 is Yud Ches. If you read Yud Ches backwards, it spells Chai, okay, life. <laughs> and if you look at Sonnet 18, its last line is, as long as men can breathe, the eyes can see, so long lives this and this gives life to thee. So he, he makes the, what, the, what the number 
spells out as a Hebrew word, right. he makes that the theme of the of the uh, fascinating. Uh, well, but there's more to that because I discovered in working with this that he actually the sonnets are actually an allegory. Uh, he has a friend in it, which is everybody knows he had this friend whom he loves very much, and he also had a girlfriend. The last uh, 28 sonnets is addressed to a female. So, so the, here he is. He has a boyfriend and a girlfriend. Well, what I discovered is that these are allegorical figures. The, the man, which is actually an idealized representation of himself, is his higher soul, the neshama. So his friend is the neshama, and he writes that he loves his higher neshama because, uh, according to Jewish uh, belief, the, uh, when you are uh, getting close to bar mitzvah, you get a higher neshama, which gives you your moral consciousness. And so he, this, he wants to be godly, so he loves his higher neshama. But against that is the lower nisham, the lower uh, spirit, which is uh, the spirit which 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 ties you to earth, which 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 are which gives you the feeling for the lust. You're born with this, and so on, and that's represented as the female, as the dark lady. So he is writing of them in his sonnets as a uh, his two friends and. Um, and he spells it out in one, one sonnet, 144, uh, where he tells you, identify, tells you who, what identity these people take. Wow. <laughs> deep. Very deep. Anyway, uh, I understand you've written several books on Shakespeare. May we see the uh, book titles, please? All right. You want to just re read yes. the titles? All right. The Hidden Shakespeare. That was my first book. Okay. And uh, interestingly, I start off with the first book. I thought that would be the end of it. But no sooner did I finish it, I got more deeper into it, and I wrote Shakespeare's uh, Judaica and the Vices, which, okay. which I found much more deep. Then I wrote the Shakespeare Codes, where I, the code was the, the numbers are letters, and that enabled me to, to ferret out the the allegory that was the sonnets. And then the final one is the uh, uh, Shakespeare's King James Bible. Wouldn't you know, he was alive when the King James Bible was made. Nobody credits him as playing any part of it. However, if you look at uh, Psalm 46 in English, count 46 words, it comes to shake. Count back 46 words, spear. Shake spear. However, people said that was just a coincidence that this occurred. However, he repeats it in other areas, and that was the subject of my book, Shakespeare's King James Bible, to tell the world that he uh, did uh, heavily contributed to it. Now, if somebody wants to buy one of these books, do you have a website? Yes, I do. Uh, well, what's your website? www.davidbash. That's B A S C H. That's www.davidbash. B A S C H. Dot net. Dot net. And you'll be able to see it, and they're available. And uh, okay, how about a phone number? Would you want people calling you? I don't think that okay. worked out. Uh, we'll, yeah. we'll stick to However, the website. However, if you get to my website, I think I have my, uh, my, uh, my uh, address. That is, you can contact. I ask for people to oh. contact oh, me, good. and uh, they can do it say through it once email. More. Say it once more. www.davidbash.net. Okay, so you, you can contact our guest tonight. If you want to purchase the books, find out more about him. By the way, and the website has downloads, so quite a bit of material right. you can get right off the uh, website. Now, one of your books, which you said, The Hidden Shakespeare, A Rosetta Stone. Uh, I know what the Rosetta Stone was. It was found in Egypt. It gave the translations. 
um, uh, of the hieroglyphics. How does that apply to Shakespeare? Well, my first book was actually the Rosetta Stone of the Merchant of Venice. Would you believe it? In what to all the world seems to be a, uh, an anti-Semitic uh, play is actually you, Shakespeare uses this to show who he is to introduce himself to the Jewish people. Uh, and that, of course, it's a little too complicated to tell off the, off the cuff. Uh, but he, he the, the story is not what people think it is. And as, I, as one of the persons who got me into the whole process was Neil Herson, who found that Antonio was a, uh, a, a former Jew. And so this changes the meaning of lines in The Merchant of Venice. So instead of when Shylock says, I hate him for he is a Christian, it doesn't mean he hates Christians. He means when he's addressing this towards Antonio, he's saying, I hate him because he's a Jew who became a Christian. And what do you know when he gives him a, a, uh, a loan, he gives him a free loan. According to the Talmud, if a Jew, you have to give a free loan. So there uh -huh. are many, many, and, and Neil Herson brought that to light, and he, he's the one who, who had a hunch that Shakespeare was a Jew. I tried to get others interested right. in it. Nobody was interested in it, so I took it upon myself. And as I checked out Neil Hurston's work, not only did I find that he knew what he was talking about, but I also uh, found new, new items in it and added quite a bit to it. Right. And, and no matter what happened, as years went by, I kept adding to it. But, but, but you know what bothers me a little bit? Shakespeare came from Stratford, which was a small town compared to London. Was there a Jewish community there? There had to be. Uh, Cecil Roth, who was a uh, historian of the Jewish people in England, noted there were a known uh, Jewish community in, uh, in Bristol and in London. Also York. Okay, that I didn't know about. Ivanhoe, it's mentioned. Oh, is that right? Yes. Okay, fine. So that's three, and three. Stratford is four, because he obviously had to have a Jewish education. He oh, yeah. must have studied the Talmud. The Talmud is an encyclopedic um, uh, tract that that has uh, it's uh, it covers the waterfront on 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 religion, on history, on philosophy. And if he read that, and he obviously did, because he shows it in his work, he, these these right. words makes, from the Talmud appear. Another thing you mentioned um, in your website, a study of steganography. What does that word mean, steganography? Steganography is a method of, uh, of, of, of code, cryptic writing, which, which is successful because nobody suspects it's there. It's secret, you see. So for example, when I talk about these embedments in it, they're, they're there for all to see. But, and for example, if you have the background that I have with some kind of Jewish education, you would be able to see that he's spelling out words that you recognize as the Aramaic uh, 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 right. Kaddish, okay? So, so, um, so, but if you're not even looking for it, it never occurred to you to look for it. Okay. I, I, what happened once, he, he had a line in one of his sonnets, you are all my art. So I read all my art, all my art. Uh. Oh, that's a word in the, in, the, in the Kaddish. And then right next to it, I see diagonally R-B-B-H, Rabba. That's another word. I kept looking and I found all the words. In, in unbelievable. The, yes, it was unbelievable to me too. The other thing yeah. I, I want to mention you mentioned in your website, Shakespeare's father, John, had another name. Yes. Well, what was the, his other name? Yes, Peter Levy, who was a English historian in his book, The Life and Times of William Shakespeare, noted that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, John was left a legacy by his father, Richard. And in the reg legacy, uh, John was named Johannem Shaker. Shaker 
happens to be a Hebrew word means false, like in the ninth commandment, aid shaker means false witness. So why would a Jew call himself shaker? Well, uh, it was illegal. That, that, that was his name? Yeah, that was the name that he was referred to. Shaker. Shaker, Johannem Shaker. And this was Shakespeare's father. That was Shakespeare's father. So, so the point is, if you want to, it was illegal to be a Jew in England from 1290, I believe it was 1290, uh, 1590, the Jews were expelled from, uh, from right. England, and it, it was illegal, and therefore, and if you wanted to live in England, you had to be a Shaker, you had to be false. So it really telling you that he is a, his identity, what he seems to be is false, but of course he has another name, Shakespeare, uh, which, they, which they did use uh, a more. Uh, okay, but that doesn't have any Jewish connotation. Yes, it does. It does? Shakespeare is in, uh, in Job. In Job, uh, the, it talks about the Leviathan. He laughs at the shaking of a spear. <laughs> so he has the, and then of course, if you look, oh if you look at his, at his, um, I have a, here, this is his uh, coat of arms. If you see the, the oh, yeah. figure, the falcon shaking a spear, you see, so he's got it there, <laughs> you see. Isn't and that something? So, uh, so everything that he indulges in, he, he introduces himself, he tells about himself, if you know how to, to yeah, read no, it. No, no, can you keep that falcon up again? You had mentioned something, the falcon's on one foot. Yes, now that relates to a, a uh, story in the Talmud with Hillel, Rabbi Hillel. A person came to Rabbi Hillel and said, I will become a Jew if you teach me the Torah while I stand on one foot, okay? He did, Hillel did, but he gave him a very short thing, which was the essence of the Torah. And Shakespeare also has a motto, non sans droicht, which is not without right, which is in, uh, it was in the application, non, not without right. That was with the uh, sketch of the, uh, of the coat of arms. Huh. So, that, so that tells you, and by the way, the, if you analyze where does it come from, not without right, Abraham says to God, if you kill the righteous and the wicked, uh, this is in Sodom, you will not do right. So therefore, that's the, if you change it into an epith into a, uh, uh, a command, uh, not without right. So, uh, so it's actually a teaching of Abraham, and through this he tells you he is a son of Abraham. Unbelievable. I'm overwhelmed by all this information. But how come? Shakespeare lived 400, about 400 years ago. 450 years ago. And how come ago. you have come along now to discover all these Jewish influences when nobody did it 100 years ago or 200 years ago? Well, I, as I said, people found the, the references, but no one thought it was uh, that he could have been a Jew. And even when Neil Hurston gave his theory, it was... Everybody said, ah, oh, come on, it you know, can't be. Well, when I checked it out, I kept finding new information about it. And, and as I was telling Barry, you, Barry, right. that, that uh, the reason why I was able to do it is because I had a Jewish education. He communicated, you know, in the Bible, Joseph's brothers didn't recognize him, you see, and, and he seats them in Egypt, when they visit him in Egypt, he seats them in accordance with their ages, you see? Mm -hmm. And then he asks, do you have a brother? So he, they told him, well, I have a brother, Benjamin is home, etc." So what he was doing is showing that he knew the family. And Shakespeare uses that device to show, to show that he is of the Jewish family, because if you have a Jewish background, you will see in many, many many, many cases that he is communicating lore and, and, and quotations from the Talmud and, and information which uh, you know about. And it's striking when you see it, when you see it occur. And, and by the way, I want to just say one yeah. thing. See, everybody says if you are a, uh, a, 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 that the Merchant of Venice is anti-Semitic, but if you understand the story, it's all opposite. 
the, the events change, just like with the discovery that Antonio is a former Jew, right. etc. Now lines change, the meaning hmm. of lines change, and you f discover uh, Shylock is not a bad man. Some people have said that Shakespeare was anti-Semitic because of his description of Shylock. What's your opinion on that? No, he, he's, he's not because he is characterized as very nice. He gives, he gives Antonio a free loan. He says, I want to win your love, and so on. And, and when he's in court, he makes appeal for the slaves in, in Venice. He says, look, uh, uh, if I told you to give your slaves your bed, would you do that, he says. So how come you're asking me right. to, to be nice to, to Antonio? Uh, but interestingly, that's a, another element in the Tal Talmud says, if you have a slave and there's only one bed in your home, you have to give that bed to your slave. <laughs> you, you cannot make him. The, yeah. the, this is fascinating. Right. But on the other hand, the connotation of Shylock, we get the English word shyster, a shyster lawyer, it's interpreted. That, that's, that's in the aftermath because okay. people don't realize it. Because when you realize that he is benign, and oh, now here's the, the uh, a, a guy, an actor, director, Abraham Marefsky, around almost 80 years ago, wrote a book, uh, Shakespeare and Shylock. And he pointed out that if you read carefully in the text, uh, Shylock does not mean to, to kill Antonio. He wants to throw a scare into him so that he will beg for mercy from the Jew. And he shows you uh, how in the dialogue. Right. But when you have directors of movies and they show you uh, and they re remove this possibility in the way they stage it, then you can't see. But the fact is, it's a, um, a charade. He's only feigning this, and you know, like he said, like he's sharpening the knife. He goes, Shylock, don't right. you have any any mercy? Uh, 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 Gratiano says, don't you have any? Can no prayers priest pierce your heart? And Shylock says, no, none that thou hast wit enough to make. Well, he's telling this to uh, Gratiano, who's a real uh, hater, and so on. However, what he means by that, none that thou has wit enough to make, right. he is insinuating, well, why doesn't Antonio uh, pray for, for appeal, Would for you, mercy? Uh, thank you. Would you believe our, we have one minute left? I, I told it. you the 30 <laughs> minutes will fly by. Oh, it did. Uh, I want to tell my viewing audience, uh, my guest is David Bash. He was a licensed architect, planner, and a celebrated author of many books about Shakespeare and his Jewish influences. It's been wonderful having you on the show, and I've learned an awful lot, and I know my viewers also, when they see the show, will also learn from it. And uh, all I can say is the best of good luck and keep on doing your research and keep on finding more and, and, and maybe, uh, You'll, you'll let the world know that Shakespeare was a Jew, and so on. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Pleasure to have you on the show. Okay.